One is called global, one is called local. And we also look at uh, how nucleotide sequence alignment was conducted and how about amino acid sequence alignment was conducted using two uh, matrices, matrices. One is called palm, one is called blossom. And from what we could do the alignment, we always ask, are uh, this alignment meaningful? So if it's meaningful, how to code score them? So what is the threshold that we set? So there is a so-called scoring matrix for, for different pump and lots of matrices. So of course we will look at some simple mathematic models that which we are not going to talk in details, but give you the idea what is that, a random model and match model, right? So after this, you will learn, know why we do sequence comparison wire alignment, understand the concept of local and global alignment, differentiate the scoring scheme for nucleotide and amino acids, and understand how to derive substitution and scoring matrices. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, similarity searching mean here. Uh, so we, we got DNA sequence or, okay. For this subject, this course can, we are go, going to cover both nucleotide sequence and amino acid sequence. So nucleotide sequence, we only got four code, right? A, T, C, or G, no others. But amino acids got 20, 20 codes because uh, representing 20 amino acids. Okay, so we know that DNA, nucleotide sequence, A, T, G, C, is actually DNA sequence. So when we talk about genome, it's all ATGC. So from the genome, the genes in the genome transcribe into mRNA, from mRNA translated into amino acid. So we got the amino acid sequence. So supposedly amino acid sequence represent the genetic codes of the DNA component, uh, counterparts, okay? So um, when we talk about gene, it could refer to both DNA or the amino acid sequence. Okay, so, so this is the idea. So we are talking about nucleotide and amino acids interchangeably. So, but for the scoring matrices, we have different matrices for nucleotide and amino acids. But for the alignment, basically the idea is the same, the global and the local alignment. So for the same application also. Okay, so in mutation is actually um, random changes. Mutation actually are random changes, uh, the spontaneous changes in our DNA. So if this is not really uh, uh, lethal mutations, that means a mutation that really kill people immediately, instantly. So the DNA will eventually be uh, inherited to the next generations. So, and most of these mutation could be somatic changes. Somatic mean it come from our cell and then it's not going to be uh, from the gametic uh, changes. That means those changes happen in the egg or the sperm DNA, okay? So that means the somatic changes come from ourselves. It's not come from our parents and so on. So that is one of the source, major source that produce variations between two individuals. So even identical twins, they are somewhat variated in terms of gene genetics because of these somatic changes. Okay, what, what to do with this um, evolution? So in evolution, as I said, Mutations are always happen, spontaneous, and it gives rise to differences between us, the so-called variations. So when variation come to a level of more than 1% in the population or more than 5% in the population, we call it polymorphisms. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, let's say in this example, the globin gene. So in the early time when the so-called common ancestor for all the uh, living things. There is a globin gene. So over time, the gene duplicate. Okay, this is another thing, uh, not covered here, but just for information. Uh, 
DNA mutations could be at the nucleotide level, that means A change to C, C change to G, and so on. But it could be at the gene, gene, genetic level, that means the whole gene change, or even the chromosomal level. So chromosome level, as you know, like translocation, inversion, uh, extra pointy, like the Down syndrome that got an extra chromosome of 21. So, but for gene duplication is also another common event, yeah, in our body. So, globin gene or the gene families, we always call it gene families, actually come from one common ancestor. So, in this case, the globin gene. So, we know that globin gene got two, two families. One is alpha gene, the, the other is beta gene. Uh, doctor, I you guess. are not recording the session. Oh, you want to record? Huh? Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, recording. Yes, the recording. Okay. Okay, we continue with the slides. Huh? So when when a common ancestor of a, of a single gene duplicates, so for this case, the globin gene, it, uh, it, it becomes two. One is called alpha chain and one is called beta chain. So we know that in human, alpha and beta chain globin, globin ch chains actually make up our hemoglobin protein, right? Which can help to carry oxygen in the rapid cells. So uh, these two genes, they eventually further duplicates into alpha chain, alpha globin families and beta globin families. So if you uh, remember, recall the last lecture on the molecular genetics, so we talk about these alpha beta genes, right? So um, so but uh, if you look further, this let's say this alpha. So alpha also uh, found in frog, in mouse, in, in other animals, and also in other animals for the beta. So eventually, this is so-called the conserved genes. That means we found that these genes are actually happening in all animals. Okay, and that's why we call it a uh, evolution from a common ancestor. So we we the we derive this common ancestor theory because we find the same gene, although there are a num a lot of variations and differences, but still they carry they are in when we do the alignment, we, we put the sequence together, whether the nucleotide sequence or, or amino acid sequence, they got a lot of similarity. And also we found that some regions are actually almost perfect and they do the same functions, okay? So we know that blood carry, uh, got the hemoglobin, carry oxygen. Also, frogs got blood, mouse got blood, they have the hemoglobin as well, but of course in different way, lah, different change or whatever. But still there are, alpha is still under one, the alpha gene family and beta gene family. Okay, so the idea here is when the alpha chain family, alpha chain, family, alpha globin families, among the animals, we call it autologs. So compare the alpha and beta, we call it paralogs. Okay. So autologs are among those sharing the same concept ones. Like. Paralogs are those in terms of evolution, they actually share the common ancestor. Okay. Anyway, all these are called homologs. So whatever logs is it, like. the idea here is, Genes are conserved. So we carry the similar sequence, similar, I'm not saying identical, similar sequence in terms of nucleotide, in terms of amino acids, and also similar functions. That's the, the so-called evolution of the genes. Lah. Okay. So we have this in mind, then we we the, the idea for this lecture is much more easier for you to understand. So why we do comparison of sequence? Yeah, why we do sequence search? 
we know that there are a lot of similarity. So I work on human, you work on mouse, you work on uh, uh, duck or whatever. So if you work on some the same gene family, we could always find the similarity. So this is a similarity search. Okay. So we talk further. Okay, next. So mutation and evolution are, are brothers. Lah. They cannot separate themselves. So if there are no mutation, there will be no evolution. Okay, because mutation is random, spontaneous. It happens every time, many, many times. And some are reserved, some are discussed. And some causing problems, some giving you a better, better tolerance for environment and so on and so on. Eventually, one people got a few millions of uh, uh, polymorphisms in the body, like I, the, the SNPs I mentioned in the, in the molecular genetics, we got a few millions between us, okay? So when there are some SNPs are good to us, they will be selected for po as a positive selection. So those genes are giving us a better um, tolerance to the environment. So if you have heard about the thrifty gene theory, so why people, when they come to the age 30, 30 plus, getting bigger and bigger, yeah, rounder and rounder, yeah, it is called secondary growth. It's not going up, but it's going melintang, um, okay? So why, why this happen? Even though the, the quantity of food we, we take in getting lesser and lesser compared to when we are in the teenage, we eat a lot, but when we are in the 30, 40s, we eat quite a little already. Yeah. Why we still grow melinda? Yeah. So this is because we don't really need such much nutrients. So thrifty genes, the idea is we don't need much nutrients. So if you take too much, that means when in the old old time when there are limited food source, when people are migrating from one place to one to another place, you eat so much. You are just uh, drinking down the people lah. when the food is limited, but well, you're still eating so much. So the idea is trick teaching is we don't need much to, to survive. So in now in the modern life, everybody, unless you are in the, the serious poverty, lah, you totally no money to buy food. Basically, everybody are eating quite a lot. Yeah. So in fact, in some country, they found that those people who are living in the poor uh, status, actually they, are, they got more factor than those who are in middle, middle class. Yeah, that's because they buy some junk food, lah, which is cheaper and got more couple. Okay, so this is our topic. Lah. But the idea here is, um, so whenever we got the mutations, some mutation will be used. Yeah. And that mutation will be reserved and inherited. So that's the call the evolution. Okay. So when there are mutation, if the mutation are reserved, uh, if this is causing not really anything to us, it's become the genetic divergence. Lah. So if it, it's causing problems, of course, if it is a late onset disease. Uh, maybe it still be inherited to the offsprings. Uh, but for those diseases who, those uh, uh, rare diseases, maybe uh, it still exists at no prevalence in the populations. Okay, so uh, mutation in nucleotides is actually quite straightforward, lah. Um, we only got four, A, T, and G, C. So A and G is the purine, C and T is the pyrimidine. So when A changed to G, so the purine changed to purine, we call it transition. When A changed to C or changed to T, a purine changed to pyrimidine base, this is called transversion. But, uh, Translation is much more to twice the common than the transversion. Okay. So anyway, this is the nucleotide. So how important is this um, change to our function of life? Okay. 
So as I told you before, DNA is simply a storage house. It stores the DNA, it stores the genetic code. If the genetic code is never expressed, the function will is never be displayed and affect us. Okay. So um, and then recall that the amino acid table, the 24 genetic codes. So we know that uh, DNA code for polypeptide by having a triplet codon, right? The genetic code. So, and then we know that the 64, the table, the genetic code for the amino acids is a total of 64 codes, right? Uh, there are a lot of redundancy, yeah. So it, it helps to buffer whenever there are mutations at the DNA level. So at what mutation, as I said in the, in the last class, especially SNPs, um, point mutation, it happened few millions between two individuals. So uh, does it really affect the function of the protein, the gene there? So DNA code for a gene, but the protein of the gene is actually the functioning unit. Okay. So if there are mutation happen at the genetic code, which don't really uh, change the amino acid. So in this case, a silent mutation. So look at this example, when, uh, when a normal situation, a TTC code for a lysine, okay. So when there's a point mutation, a SNP happen at the last code of the triplet codon TTC, the C become T. So at mRNA level, yes, it changed, but at protein level, it's still the lysines. So refer back to the genetic code, the 64 genetic codes for 20 amino acids. So lysine is co coded by a few codon, right? So eventually this mutation at the DNA we will not affect the amino acid it code. Okay. So in in a product in when you look at the whole polypeptide, the whole protein, the function will be just the same. So this is called silence mutation. So when the point mutation happen, make the TTC become ATC. ATC when turn to mRNA, mRNA is called a UAG is called and it's known as a stop codon. Stop codon means that the whole strand of the polypeptide will be terminated for translation during the translation process. Okay, so nonsense, nonsense. Lah. So totally end the, the process. So as I said, you got a DNA, DNA code for 300 base pair. So 300 base pair is actually a 100 amino acid. So a strand, a strand of 100 amino acids. So in the middle, let's say at point 20, it turned to uh, UAG, MR, the stop codon. So from the original 100 base, 100 amino acids, it become 20 truncated amino acids. That's mean putus di tengah tengah lah, truncated. So this, this protein usually is no, no longer functioning lah. So this is called nonsense the protein is totally disrupted. So how about this? This is the, the, the main characters to data, missense. Missense for cons uh, conservative and non-conservative. Okay, so when talk about the functionality of protein, so it is much more complex. So we we'll talk about the protein things in the next, next lecture. Lah. So it is much more complex because genetic, Genetic code ATGC, protein 20 amino acid. And it is even worse if amino acid is not simply the sequence. Amino acid form the functioning protein by having the secondary and tertiary structure. They fold to itself, fold to into a special 3D structure. And different structure got different active sites for different purpose. Okay, so. E and the amino acids, the 20 amino acids actually could be classified into four, four groups, polar, non-polar, acid, uh, acid and uh, alkaline one, right? Actually, there are much more uh, special groupings. 
not only that. Okay, so we have to make sure that if the for this missense conservative mutations, yes, it does change the lysine in this example, lysine into arginine. Yeah, but arginine is still the same uh, biochemical properties properties with lysines. So if look at the structure, they are quite similar. Yeah. So they are grouped under those, uh, I forget what's the group. So the biochemical grouping, they are still the same. So usually this may not change the function or affect the function of the protein that it code for, the DNA code, okay? Even though there is a mutation change of amino acid, but the functionality usually are not really affected, okay? So how about non conservative yeah and this is the most scary one so when there is a normal one become a totally different uh different amino acid highly possibly this will change the structure of protein and sub subsequently the function of the protein so you got the same gene you i got the same gene but there's a point mutation in the dna and that point mutation in the dna change the amino acid genetic code in one of the genetic code of the mRNA. So when it is, the mRNA is translated into polypeptide, which become a protein later on, the protein could have different structure or different biochemical productivity because of this simple point mutation that changed the amino acid. Eventually, uh, it gives us different functional proteins and it, was, it, it becomes worse when the, function, the protein is no longer functioning when the protein is an essential protein for many, many biochemical uh, mechanism in our body, okay? So that's the thing now. So I think one example is a sickle cell animal. So don't mix up the sickle cell animal with the thalassemia. Sickle cell anemia is actually just a point mutation in the DNA and the point addition actually changed the amino acid into different amino acid. And some of these amino acids is, is, is very essential for the stability of the, the globin alpha or beta, I forgot, alpha globin uh, structure. Eventually, the hemoglobin is no longer stable, out of shape, and make up, make the, make the, Rapid cell becomes sickle shape like a bullet a bit. Yeah. And that is the killing point. Uh. Make the people sick because the, the rapid cell are, are not normal and got all sort of clin clinical complications uh, like uh, breast pain, uh, fatigue, and need blood transfusion regularly. Okay, so this is the, the idea here. Right, we move on. So uh, the same theory behind. So homology is an evolutionary statement, which means descent from a common ancestor. So uh, especially in the similarity in DNA or protein sequences, the common 3D structure in amino acids. If anything got the same sequence in amino acids and uh, nucleotides or similar 3, 3, 3D structure usually have the common functions, okay? Uh, this means by utilizing similarity of DNA or amino acid sequence could help to predict or determine function of gene, the protein, or evolution, okay? So one, one more example. So look at this histone H1 uh, amino acid sequence of the histone H1 at the residue 120, 180 of this histone H1 gene. So when we align the human, mouse, rat, and cow, and chimpanzee together, so alignment means to, to put the sequence together by similarity, okay? So alignment, DNA alignment means to put the sequences together based on similarity. And similarity usually you, you actually is the reflecting the homology, which is the evolution of the genes. Okay, 
So that's mean why we do the sequence search back to our, our title today. Why we do the DNA sequence search or protein sequence search? We actually want to know the function of the genes of based on the similar sequences or the evolution based on similar in sequences. Okay. So, so look at this. Uh, we got a lot of conserve one. Conserve one are uh, those uh, in the star. So everybody is the same. K or everybody is K. But uh, we also got conservative one, some S, some A, but they are of the, of the same biochemical properties of the amino acid group. Okay, they are also non-conservative, totally different amino acids, and all these semi-conservative and so on. So the question is, does human share higher similarity with, with chimpanzee than other mammals? So the question, the, the answer is yes. If you look at this, uh, the first one. Okay, the first one. So the first uh, non-conserved amino acid. So human is S, mouse, rats, cow are A, but chimpanzee S. So based on what is not enough, uh, we look at more. So this is T, the second one is T, chim T also, L, L, A, A, yeah. So we know that human and chimpanzee share more similarity. So in terms of evolution, they are much more closer. Yeah, that's why people say human and chimpanzee are cousins. Huh? So if you look at the phylogenetics tree of the human, all the primates, lah, including human, and all the primates, monkeys, apps, uh, and so on. Who are the closest to human? In terms of evolution, the closest to human are chimpanzees. Yeah. Not orangutan, not the monkey, piasa, no. Closer to us are chimpanzees. Yeah. So uh, not, not the gorilla, the, the King Kong in the, the movie. Yeah. No, totally no. It's quite far away but the closest are our chimpanzee. That's why scientists always call chimpanzee is the human person. Okay, so is human evolutionary closer to chimpanzee? Yes, based on sequence similarity, which reflect the homology, which reflect the evolution. So human is evolutionary closer to chimpanzee, correct? Right. Oh, so this is slide number 10. So now we, we ask why we compare sequences, why we do similarity sequence search. So in order to, to identify sequences found in lab experiments. So this is close, very down to earth. Lah. So now you take the, the FIP. So you, your supervisor give you a primer, okay, PCI and sequence it. So after the sequencing, what you do, do plus. So BLAST is actually searching the similar sequence over the gene bank database. So, so what, what is this doing? Why, why you need to do so? You ask yourself, why am I so ask me to do these things? So simply to identify sequence found in lab experiments. So you say you, you are using a set of primer to amplify the gene ABC. So sure that your, your, what you amplify in the DNA PCR band is really the ABC gene. Yeah, then you need to do the plus uh, similarity search over the gene bank. So to confirm, yes, this is the ABC gene. So that match the first one, identify sequences found in lab experiments. Of course, uh, lectures of this uh, bioinformatics, we look at the broader pictures. Lah. So we also want to compare non-genes to non-ones. So now, um, uh, to identify mutations. So it could be within the same species. Let's say uh, pe the people who are, who are having autism and the people who are not having autism. So we have the case and control, right? The association studies. So we compare. So we also want to identify the mutations. Then we identify mutation in what genes? Those who are having autism have such a mutations. Okay, so the third one, compare genes from different species. This is especially for functional or evolutionary studies. All right, so um, 
Oh, so this how to relate this? Okay. Um, as I said, if they are having the homologous sequence, so they are evolutionary related. So for those who are evolutionary related, is basically uh, having the same functions. They are the, under the same gene family families. Okay. So these were functional or evolutionary studies to annotate the function of the gene. So this is especially for those who are doing RNA work. Lah. So I call it RNA, I, I reverse transcribe into cDNA, and then I sequence it, I clone and sequence it. So I want to know what is this cDNA doing? Okay. So when you got a cDNA, you, you sequence it, you compare the gene bank, or you, you since the cDNA is come from mRNA, you could also convert it into amino acid sequence. Okay, okay. I want to say um, in labs, when we do studies, right, rarely we will do amino acid sequencing because this is very, very expensive. And you only sequence a stretch of 10 or 20 already, many, many thousand already. But we could always sequence DNA sequence. Yeah, but you may be confused DNA sequence but I'm not, I'm doing mRNA work, well. I'm doing RNA work. So don't forget RNA is a single stranded. So when we do DNA sequencing, we have to ensure that the sequencing material is double stranded DNA. So how to make a single stranded RNA become double stranded DNA? So we could do the cDNA synthesis and the subsequent PCR. So this is the molecular techniques things that I'm not going to touch more. So when you call the cDNA sequence, then you could you know that this is from mRNA. Man. mRNA have all the genetic codes, man. triplet codons. Man. So you could convert the cDNA sequence into amino acid sequence. Yeah, simply using the genetic codes and some computer programs. Okay, so eventually from one stretch of one KB cDNA, you got it. You will got 323 amino acids. As I said, Sequencing of amino acids straight away is truly expensive. You we could never sequence 333 amino acids, but we could sequence the cDNA. Right? So sequencing one KB of cDNA proper actually just 50 plus 50, 54 or 55 again. Yeah. All right. So next is identifying new gene homologs. Okay. So let's say you are working on some endemic species. Uh, you got some species of only found in Sabah, uh, whether it's a wildcat or a, a very uh, exotic frog, la, snail, la, whatever. So you want to look at the, the species never studied before. So we want to look at the new gene homolog. So you could do this as well. All right. So what we do, alignment for similarity search. So when we, whenever we do similarity search, basically we need to do alignment. Okay. So whenever we say we do alignment, the purpose is for similarity search. Yeah. And same thing lah. Okay. So similarity searching is based on alignment. So let's say given you these two sequence lah, of different length of different sequence uh, content, okay? So when we do alignment, the alignment is will be done by computer programs. Lah. It will be like this, okay? So we got a sequence, we do the alignment, we, we look like this. Okay, the outcome is, mm. so we see those matching one got the, got the straight, straight line, the bar, right? So T match with T sequence one match with sequence two. So for those who are not matching is there's no bar lah, MT. But for those uh, match nobody, uh, MT, MT component in the opposite string, it is called an Intel. Intel mean what? Is contain two things, insertion or deletions. So usually we will use sequence two to compare sequence one, okay? Or in a general 
general practice is usually the sequence one is the reference sequence. So let's say you work on one gene found in malaria. So I will use the, the one of the sequence in the database as the reference sequence. Then I use my own sample, I do the PCR, I get the DNA sequence and align to the reference sequence. Okay. So you will get, you will find out the differences between the reference sequence and your sample sequences. Yeah, that's the idea. So, so let's say you do the alignment with the reference sequence or the sequence one, I mean. So you will see the, the match one, the not match one. So the so-called insertion is your sequence call it, but the reference sequence do not have it, insertion. Or deletion is your, the reference sequence call it, but your DNA sequence do, do not have it. So that is deletion. So how about gaps? Gaps are those uh, opening due to the insertion or deletion in DELS, okay? But also we need to uh, be careful at the both ends. There are not, there are regions that are totally no match yeah, because of different size of the sequence card or what. So this is not the in DELS, uh, okay? This is simply the unaligned region. So the total sequence from the first one aligned to the reference, the sequence one, to the last one aligned to the, the reference sequence or the sequence one, the total region, we call it alignment region. So now you are clear with this um, uh, naming. So if you see a uh, mismatch, A match to G, T match to G, G uh, usually we call it substitutions. Substitution is another name for the same point mutation uh, or the single nucleotide polymorphism, the SNPs. So these are used in the translator, but it, although it's got some technical differences, but usually uh, we understand this way. Uh, okay, so now it's clear uh, for this one. Okay, before we move on, uh, anybody got questions? Uh? No, doctor. What? Okay. Yes, no. So now, uh, just now, we thought we say we whenever you do this, compare the sequence, or we search, search the sequence by similarity, we need to do the alignment. So alignment when we do alignment for two sequence, let's say just now what I show you one as the sequence one, the so called reference sequence, the other one is your query your 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 sample sequence. So this is called pairwise alignment. Okay, so the so-called alignment is to align two sequences. Either this is DNA or protein in a quite a straightforward computation. Yeah. So now is what the sequence are, at what region the sequence are similar. Okay, so Two sequences can always be aligned. Yeah, but the problem is whether the alignment makes sense or not. Okay, so the sequence uh, alignments, to make the sequence alignment sensible, uh, we have no choice to develop scoring system. So sequence alignment has have to be scored. And often there's more than one solution with the same score. Okay, what I mean here, sometimes, when we do the sequence alignment, we will find this. Yeah. So we the sequence alignment got two ways. One is called global, one is called local. We talk about this in the next slide. The idea is we let's say the sequence that we have look like this. So those blocks in blue are actually the common between two sequences. Those blocks in other color are the unique sequence of each sequence here. Those block in white are those totally unmatched sequence. Lah. So if we do the alignment between two sequences, we found that the alignment we try to map, to match it, those were of the similar ones. So eventually those in the blue will be arranged together like this. 
So those in the middle, like this um, blank with dashes, are actually the, in the sequence two, it does not have it, but in sequence one, it has it. Okay, so it become an indels already here. The same at the two hujong, the, the yellow one, the yellow block, and the green block. So, uh, so now the, the idea is we know that similarity reflects homology, reflects similar function, reflects evolution. Okay, so if we do the alignment, of course, we want to align the similar one. Okay, so eventually, if we let's say if we have a more simple sequence, like two sequence, there are the white one. Let's say look at the, the, the one at the bottom, the two, the example at the bottom. So we see that those in the white are actually the mismatch. Okay, mismatch region. But we found that actually a particular region in the sequence one has a similarity, high similarity to, to the region in sequence two, but the locations are, are different in two sequences. Yeah. So what should we do? Okay, what should we do? So let's say, given you two sequence of 12 M necrotides, LEC and LED, then we do the alignment. So there are two possible outcomes here, two possible outcomes. Now. So one is the, the global alignment. Mm -hmm. Global alignment means that we try to incorporate all nucleotides and amino acid sequences into the, the alignment. Or the second outcome is called, we call it local alignment, that try to minimize mismatches or indels. So you see, look at the outcomes. For the global alignment, we have seven matches, three mismatches, and four indels. But for the local alignments, the one in the in the red box is only counted. Those who are not counted is not under the local alignment. So these are considered mismatches, as I show in the bottom example. Okay. They only counted those in the red box, red uh, square box, not square, rectangle box. So look at the local element, it got seven matches, one mismatch, and two intels. So in terms of scoring, of course, the local element sounds better because it has less mismatch and less intels. Yeah. So as I said, alignment based on similarity, the more similarity, the more similar the sequence, the more better it is. So the, this is a very simple concept. But how to turn the simple concept into quantity? Yeah, so we found that uh, local one got less mismatch and less intels. So now we need to know how to count it and how to score it. All right. But before we, we go further for the scoring, we I would like to introduce you the so-called global and local alignment. So as I as I show in this slide, slide 12, the global alignment is try to match, try to align as many as possible. Uh, actually, no, they try to align complete and complete sequence of both sequences together. Try the best. Okay. So eventually, um, you will align by similarity, uh, but end up if we introduce a lot of gaps. All right. But for local alignment, it doesn't care anybody else. It, it just want to find the matching one. Okay. So this is technically two different ways. In terms of computer, this is technically two different ways. So then why we need to do such thing? So global is to attempt to align the entire sequence end to end, from the end to another end. So for a local is to find a specific segment, the local region with the highest similarity. And so for what? You will ask for what? So this is for aligning closely or evolutionary close related sequences. 
for, for local, it is to, for aligning destiny or diverse related sequences. Okay, so let's say, for example, we want to, uh, for, if we could do global alignment, we should do the alpha genes of all the mammals for this global alignment. If you want to do the alpha and beta gene or even delta genes of different animals, we should do the local alignment because they are distantly related. And for global, it's for closely related. Okay. So further is to compare homologous genes, proteins with similar functions. But for local is to identify short conserved regions, domains or motif in two proteins. Okay, this is another further story about proteins and amino acids. We, we will cover in the next, next lectures. Meaning that, uh, let's say you go to the forest, you got the uh, very special bacteria produce antibiotics. Now, this, this bacteria is quite a new species. Yeah. So we want to know what are the genes that actually give us the possibility, the properties to produce uh, special antibiotics. Uh, so we know that the antibiotic synthesis pathway involves a number of genes. Okay, so we start off, look at those genes. Yeah. And then we found that even though this new species uh, uh, don't really has very little similarity to other genes known to involve in the antibiotic synthesis pathway, but it still share a little domains of motifs. So domain of motifs are actually the most important sequence of the proteins that actually give it, give it the functions. Yeah. So that means even though the sequence, let's say the ABC, gene ABC in bacteria, let's say gene ABC in E. coli, and the gene similar gene ABC in the new bacteria you found, maybe the sequence, the similarity is just 30%. Yeah, but it still share a little bit of motifs or domains, which is a short regions, uh, conserved regions. Yeah, they are, they are almost identical or identical, or almost identical. And that could help you to answer the function of the proteins, right? All right, so uh, some more information is global alignment is quite intensive. Lah. So computa computationally intensive, that means it needs a lot of uh, RAM to run it. So local, we just need to look for a small fragment segments which are similar. So that's why we do the local alignment. Since we're looking at the small segments, the computer power that we need, of course, is much lesser. And of course, it will be turned out to be very fast. Lah. So both are actually two, two ways of alignment. And these different ways of alignment are actually run based on the different algorithms. So algorithms is actually a, like a model, lah, how they work out. Okay, so of course we are not statisticians, we are not computer scientists, we are not going to study algorithm here. But the idea here is two ways based on two different algorithms. Okay, so some other tools for, for local alignment is the BLAST lab, we use it every day. For those who are working on DNA or proteins, we always do BLAST. So BLASTing is actually local alignment. So we could do global lah, using GAP and I mean other tools. For using how to use database and other tools, it will be covered in the next lecture. Lah. So the outcome alignment is should be okay. The alignment should be optimal that maximize the number of matches and minimize the number of gaps. So adding gaps actually reduces mismatches. Yeah. So why you find it why it is quite contra contradictory. Yeah. You say you want to maximize number of matches. Yeah. 
and you also want to minimize the number of gaps, but adding gaps actually reduce mismatches. So if it does mean you add gaps, we will add even more matches. Lah. So of course, uh, we could not do so, so recklessly. Lah. We need to be uh, balanced up. And of, of, of course, it's biologically sensible. Lah. Okay, we not simply just add up and do this just to make the alignment chantic. So we have to make sure that this is um, biologically meaningful. Okay, so permitting the insertion of many gaps can lead to high scoring alignment of non homological sequence nonsense alignment. So what I say just now is, yes, you add up a lot of gaps. Yeah, okay, you find that okay after add the gaps, there are many matches already, but this is no point. Yeah, this is nonsense alignment. So gaps are bad things, actually. Yeah, gaps are bad things. So we need to penalize gaps and force us alignment to have relatively few gaps. Yeah. So if we do alignment, we have a lot of break up of the sequence into gaps in order just to make the alignment chantic. Actually, this is nonsense. Lah. This is not biologically uh, relevant. And that's why we need to ensure that it will not got if you never got a lot of gaps. Okay. So we need the balance and trick off. Lah. So we must get a very steep penalty for gaps. And multi necrota amino acid gaps do as it and quite common. Lah. So another contradictory uh, idea here. You say you don't want gaps, but actually in nature, naturally their uh, amino acid and DNA sequence are different, different to each other simply by having a deletion or insertion. The, when the two sequences are aligned together, it becomes the gaps, the indels become the gaps. So how? So new gaps will be penalized, but much smaller if the gaps extend. So let's say, I got a polypeptide, a same species. I compare two samples from the same species. So I got the same gene for comparison. And this gene, I, I do comparison for individual number one got 99 amino acid, but individual number two got 100 amino acids. So there is less of one amino acid in the individual one. So, but Biologically, this is very common. You are lacking of one amino acid. Yeah. But you're still having a, maybe the function of the proteins totally unaffected. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. So this is a natural occurrence. La. So it based on the genes that we study. La. I cannot say every occurrence is natural. Maybe some simply the mutation that will cause problem. Okay. So Anyway, we need to have a very proper scoring scheme for that. So an alignment score aims at providing a scale to measure the degree of similarity. Okay, to measure the degree of similarity between two sequences and tasks, make it possible to quickly distinguish among the many subtly different alignments that can be generated for any two sequences. Okay, simply put is we want to have the scoring system to find the best score. And that best score will be used. So with the alignment, you, you produce a number of possibility alignments. Okay, but we need to have the measurement and measure the best one. So the scoring scheme contains two separate elements. First, we assign a value to pair of aligned residues. So we give a positive score to matches and negative zero or negative score to mismatches. And we, got, uh, we give the, the gaps much, much negative value to, to the gaps. So let's say that it's not com, com, uh, compulsory. Let's say the, the, the match we score it to A and A match, we, we give it uh, two marks. 
So A and T mismatch, we have a deduction of four marks, minus four. So if there are gaps A over a, a gap, so we give a deduction 12. Yeah. So the score will, will give us a better idea how to measure the degree of similarity. Lah. Because as we say, we don't want gaps to happen so much. Okay. All right. So, column 17. So, the square similarity on this score align sequences. So, um, as I said, we, when you do the similarity searching, similarity searching of the sequences, uh, alignment, so it apply for the nucleotide and the amino acid sequences. But when we come to the scoring uh, schemes, not the scoring ways of Nucleotide and DNA uh, polypeptides are actually quite different. Because why 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 is it quite different? Uh, recall what I said just now. Uh, nucleotide sequence just form uh, A T G C and A T G C uh, no other way. But amino acids got 20, 20 amino acids, and plus plus the biochemical properties. Got alkaline, got polar, non-polar, and also we those also need to look at the location of this amino acid. If the amino acid is at the active site, the the enzymatic site of the protein, is there mutation? Of course, it will cause the protein non-functioning. So we need to consider all these for amino acid sequences for protein alignment, sequence alignment. So the scoring system for proteins are much, much more complicated okay, compared to the DNA scoring system. So the DNA scoring system is very simple, just match a mismatch and the gaps. Protein sequence, we need to have the scoring matrix. Yeah. So different amino acids will have different matrices and also based on different hypotheses of similarity homologous. So we'll go further on this. So uh, amino acid AA have varying degree of similarity taking into consideration of number of mutation to convert one to another. So if a lysine become an arginine, how many rounds of mutation should happen? Maybe one, maybe two, maybe three. Yeah. So number of mutation to cover, convert one to another. Okay. Yeah. So how to observe mutation frequency? Uh, so some, we found that ethics, the scientists using several thousand of amino acids protein sequence, and they found that some mutations do happen at different frequencies. So alanine become a, a proline. What's the frequency? They actually found the frequency and the frequency of different proteins are different. Ah, sorry, frequency of muta mutation of different amino acids are actually totally different. And we also need to consider chemical similarity, that, as I say, non-polar, polar, acetate, and also the location of the amino acids. So gaps at both DNA and amino acid sequence due to intels will be analyzed sharply. Uh, and the gaps extension also will also be penalized. So the choice of metrics can strongly influence the outcome of the analysis. Scoring metrics implicitly represent a particular theory of evolution. That's why I, why I said we need to be, for analysis is very, very complex, we need to consider the theory of evolution as well. So if we, if we are comparing alpha globin and the delta globin, uh, there is what? Paradox, right? They are quite distantly related. So we need to choose the uh, matrix, scoring matrix suitable for distantly related proteins. But if we want to compare the sequence of amino acid sequence of the alpha globin in human primates and, and some birds, because it is under the same family of alpha globin, this is quite uh, closely related. Lah. So you should use another matrix. 
So another matrix score differently for different mutation of amylases. So understanding theory underlying a given scoring matrix can aid in making proper choice. Right. So as I say in the first lecture, bioinformatics is not simply techniques or just click, click, click analysis. Yeah. Uh, bioinformatics is actually a standalone discipline. We need to know the theory behind, especially the evolution. Yeah. And it, then we have the common ancestor, the gene duplicate, the gene mutate, and 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 become multiple gene families and family and inherited in different species. Yeah. How what is the parallel, homologs, autologs, and so on? Yeah. Then before we could do a proposed analysis, we need to choose the best, the, the suitable one, not simply choose or take anyone and use it. Okay. All right. So, so DNA scoring system, this is for DNA, it's much more easier. Lah. So if you got a match, one. If you got a mismatch, zero. If you got a gaps, minus three. If you got an extension, minus zero, one, X, extra minus zero, one. Lah. And drawing a scoring matrix of the pair sequences, like this, uh, the matrix. So recall the matrix, the same thing as our mathematics class in form four, form five, the matrix. Uh. So in form four, form five, uh, even form six, uh, when we learn about matrix, I have no idea what is this for. Why I need to learn matrix? The first thing is, why I need to learn matrix? If I am businessman, I just need to count how much, how much I earn, how much I lose. Yeah and how to make much more money, how to reduce uh, the what percentage charged by the by the by the bank or even how to pay less tax. I don't need metrics, right? Why I need to learn metrics in math in, in form four form five class. So this why I, I quite wonder what happened. But once co go to um a lot of things. Lah. Metrics are actually very useful for many, many things. Mechanical engineering, all this engineering need the metrics to count a lot of things. But for evolution, we need metrics also when we compare DNA sequences, uh, different sequences of different things. Lah. We have two, two components to compare. So we come up with the metrics. Okay. Now, so before that, okay. So for this is still nucleotide. Yeah. So we let's say we have a sequence here, compare the another sequence. So then there are, we open our gaps. So if we do a local alignment, we just align the local a segment of the highly similar one. We got only four. But if we do the global alignment we allow gaps to happen just to uh, fit in everybody in for to do the end-to-end -end alignment, global alignment. We uh, forcefully add up gaps. Once we add up gaps, we need to penalize. So total, if we open one gap and extend it, a total of three, three nucleotide here. So it's three times 0 0.1 one uh three plus 0 0.1 times two because it's opening extend two gaps right so total three so it is 3.2 okay? the score is 3.2 so but once you got the gaps open we actually could could get from four matches become eight matches but as i said gaps must be penalized whatsoever yeah in order not to make things like uh, biologically not relevant. Everybody can make up, open up the gaps and just to do alignment. So eventually when we, we need to deduct the gaps opening score and its extension, eventually the total score of the alignment is 4.8. Still 4.8 is better than 4. Of course 4.8 will, will be chosen for the alignment. Okay, and it make more sense. Because if we got the sequence here, we only got four align, uh, matches. But if we do the global alignment, allowing the gaps to happen, we add eight. Yeah. Okay. So 
So purposely I leave it blank so that you can digest a bit. Yeah. So okay there. So at this point. So don't so okay. Doctor, can you please um explain a little bit more about the calculation just now? <laughs> can about you like what? Which one? Uh the DEG and the, the using the formula, right? So I just don't really get the DEG. DEG. Yeah. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Okay. So the get parameters look at here, the red box at the bottom. Whenever we open up a cap. We, we do not look at the number of nucleotide inside first. Once you open up a gap, so in this place, we call it insertion deletion here, this region, small region. This is opening a gap. So straight away, we need to minus three. The score, we have a penalty of three marks, minus three. So, and then don't forget that open a gap, not for one nucleotide. Actually, it's got three nucleotides. But at gap extension, we have additional charge of 0 0.1. So second nucleotide at 0 0.1, third nucleotide at 0 0.1. So total 0 0.2. So the total gap penalty is 3 plus 0 0.2. Yeah, this insertion deletion region. So but once we add the gaps, we have a alignment of matches of 8, total 8. So how, what's the total scope? As I said, gaps are actually penalty. So of course it is in negative form. Right? So matches eight, penalty is 3.2. So eight minus 3.2, we got 4.8. Still higher than the local alignment of just four matches. That's the idea. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh... Yeah, so far so good luck. Perhaps if you have uh, exercise some uh, questions. <laughs> of course, uh, you have more questions and some practicals uh, for this. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, don't helpful, worry. Yeah. This is just lecture for okay. understanding. But once we start off the practicals and even the, the midterm, we will have such questions. Uh. Uh, okay, okay. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, don't worry about this. We will have practicals. Okay, so next we, we continue. Uh, I cannot finish. I got to go at 4 p.m. because we got an important meeting just announced yesterday evening. Okay, so anyway, uh, this lecture will be extended uh, because um, I look at the syllabus. Actually, the similarity searching database are, are actually refer to the same thing. We do a similar search, must do the database also. Yeah. So anyway, so um, all the lectures, even though it's not directly have the same title as the syllabus synopsis, but actually it cover up everything. Okay. So next, um, wow, too many slides. So if we can't finish it, we just continue next week. Don't worry. So the scoring for amino acids are much, much complex. As I say, the uh, amino acid is, have four groups, right? This is the general groupings, general biochemical groupings. Simply one is charged, one is non-charged, one is polar, one is hydrophobic, and also special cases. So if you look at the structure, there are those who are sharing the structure will be under the same groupings. Okay. Those who are charged or not charged. Yeah. But if you look further, there are also kind of much more biophysical things that we need to consider. Not only the hydrophobic uh, or charged, uh, there are also the whether they call the aromatic ring uh, the structure. Where this is a very small I amino mean, acid, tiny. It is aliphatic. Aliphatic means there is a long tail of the carbon carbon chain, yeah, and so on and so on. And also, there are some guys who are standing in tengah tengah, yeah. So some 
There is no frog jumping here and there, but actually they are, they have their own grouping. Okay, yeah. So luckily no frogs are jumping here and there, even even worse. So this is the amino acids in nature in nature. So in order to to score the alignment amino acids, we need to take as much as possible the the i the the uh, properties yeah, of these amino acids. But how to take these properties? Uh, this is biochemical, physical things. Uh, how to take this? Okay, so okay, look at this. AA have different biochemical and physical properties that amino AA mean amino acid. Uh, have different biochemical and physical properties that influence the relative replaceability in <coughs> evolution. Square matrices should be should able to reflect number of mutation to convert one to another. Now, uh, this is a, a list of things. Uh, this means we need to have a versatile or at least comprehensive matrix that reflects number of mutation to convert one amino acid to another. The chemical similarity, polar and non-polar, of some mutation frequency. How often is this amino acid? To, to be mutated, yeah. The property of occurrence of each amino acid. So some amino acids are, are common, some are very non-common, like the tryptophan is very non-common, yeah. Some amino acids we could synthesize in our body, some amino acids can, we could only get it from food, yeah. Of course, those we can only get it from external are the valuable one. Uh. And the valuable one is very dangerous. Uh, if you've got any mutation that uh, in the genes that how to acquire this amino acid from food, we are in trouble uh, and so on. So simple scoring scheme, match one, match match zero, gap minus one. So uh, the, the very simple one are uh, totally not sufficient. So, and also we need to re recall missense mutation, both conservative and non-conservative. So whether this mutation will cause any problem or not, conservative or non-conservative, we need to have a matrix, which is versatile. Matrix, as I say, is just a scoring things. So how to have this specialized matrix to cover all these things into a simple uh, 2D matrix? So, okay, it's okay, we will look at this. So in order to have uh, much more information, we need to know the relative mutability. Uh. So relative mutability actually to answer the, what is called it, how often the mutation frequency, how often the, the occurrence. Yeah. This is uh, a, a table that answer the questions, two questions here. Relative mutability is the, of amino acids is the weightage that how often amino acids will change by other amino acids due to mutations. So what uh, we 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 uh, use alanine, a alanine, yeah, as a as a as a standard. Uh, so we make it at hundred percent. So for those who are much more two times of it, two hundred sixty two percent are C. For those who are very little, just uh, what was this? Seventy-seven percent of relative to A. Okay, so this is how they call it. Uh, you will ask. Actually, the base. This is uh, work done by uh, Professor Day of. Yeah, maybe about fifty years ago. So this. This scientist, he she got a a collection of database, a database, a collection of all amino acids of two thousand plus genes, yeah, and then she do the alignment of all these amino acid. Uh, I don't know how to do it in the old time, <laughs> and found that actually, uh, based on evolution, as I said, as she did a phylogenetic tree also. Based on evolution, she found out this relative mutability. Okay, so and this one will be used for the matrix. Okay, so how to penalize gaps in amino acids? 
So uh, gap openings is still three, but uh, gap opening is zero for global alignment. Yeah. So um, don't worry about this. We this is there is a so called blossom, but right. Okay, we will go further first. So all this information, the relative mutability and the biochemical uh, information already reflect in the relative mutability and so on. Okay, so from that we will derive a substitution matrix. Yeah, the alignment score attempts to measure the likelihood of a common evolutionary ancestor. To achieve this mathematically, alignment of two residue from two sequences under two complete models. Okay, now one we start to say mathematics. Mathematics, informatics, and genetics are actually all these uh, statistic probability. Kebarangkalian, <laughs> the one that I hate most in form four and form six. So I, I believe you do. You you feel the same thing like to me like, like me. We don't like kebarangkalian because we never know what is that. Yeah. So what we what we can only recall kebarangkalian is. So if you got a coin, we flip it. How many times we got the head? How many times we got the number, right? So the, how many times you flip it, and so on and so on. Yeah, if you got a dice, how many times you flip? You got not one, we got six, we got five. All these are probability. So for those who are buying this Totoga four digger, whatever digger, all these are probability. Yeah. So, uh. I myself never buy all these things because this probability is beyond my understanding. I would say, yeah, I I got a forty, right? Forty, ten numbers, zero to nine, ten numbers. So ten times ten times ten times times is about rapakali subu subu ribu. So there's subu ribu no, ah subu ribu possibility, yeah. Then I want to win one. The top price for me, like I waste my time, <laughs> so that's why I never bought uh, the 40 because for this probability, Kaparangalian is beyond our knowledge, our, our understanding. But for scientists, the brain different when these scientists who are biologists themselves use the mathematics and statistics, they're actually like two in one, a uh, superman. They can do biology together and the statistic to do together and come up with these bio, phylogenetic things, the algorithm, the scoring, matrices, and so on. Yeah. So, okay, back to this. If you want to have a substitution matrix, that means how, as I say, substitution matrix here is when A tend to T, uh, when the amino acid, A tend to amino acid. G and uh, acid G tend to amino acid K like this. Yeah. How of we need to have a matrix based on the non uh, amino acids uh, under the evolution models. Okay. So if we want to do this, we need to have a probability on hand. Nah. Simply put, we need to know what is uh, whether this is the probability is there to happen. So for simply put, based on the non amnesis sequence of few thousand of non sequence of amnesis from different genes, the scientists come up with this probability. Okay, so from how uh, amnesis A become amnesis K, there is a probability. All right. So uh, to achieve this mathematically, we need to do the models. Uh, so whenever we have a property, we need to come up with the models. And the models is actually the relative models, okay? So the model R, the random models, compared to match model, the M model. The R model is actually sequences not related. For the M, R sequences are related due to evolutionary process, and there's high correlation between aligned residues. For model R, every position and type of M is totally independent of every other in a protein. 
So if we say independent, this is mathematically independent. As I said, the 40, right? Four number. First number, 10 possible number. The second number is 10 possible number. The 10 possible number. So the possibility is 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. It's not going to say if you've got one number one in the first number, the probability you've got number four in the second number is higher, no such thing. Yeah. So the random model is totally random, totally independent. Okay. But in evolution, we know that evolution means inheritance. Things come together. So they must have some kind of dependency, some kind of uh, relatedness. So if you put it into mathematics, it is called the probability of occurrence of particular residue depend not on the two of other residue, but on the residue at the equivalent position in the sequence of common ancestors. That's mean if this is a evolutionary related amino mean, acids, it must be dependent and it must be uh, somewhat related to others. Okay. So that means if you want to have a probability, you must be ensure that M is much more bigger than R. Okay. So this is a, a clearer information uh, examples. So let's say the, the, the bottom V shape, the common ancestor. So we have the AE, G, H, G, okay? And I, the G become I, this G become C at, at the location number three and number five, okay? So when they share the common ancestor, they share the same sequence. When there are mutations, they become two different sequence, okay? So they split out into two. So when this, AEGHD for there are more further mutations. It has the uh, the progeny, the offspring of ADGHD when E change to D. When A for the first analysis change to D, it becomes DEGHD. And so and so the same for this AEIHC. When H become a K, they have the progeny, the offspring of AEIKC. Okay, what, what does it mean here? So you got a common ancestor, got two sons. The, the first son got another two sons, the second son got another two sons. Yeah, these two sons, these sons are actually uh, different in one or two mutation. Okay, yeah. So from this, we can draw out the phylogenetic tree. All right. So the substitution matrix is a phylogenetic tree is actually a tree to represent, not to represent, to illustrate graphically the idea of evolution. Okay, how, how things are related to each other, how things are split. Yeah, so, so the substitution matrix must reflect the evolution. So the, is, it is calculated by observing the number of accepted mutations in the constructed phylogenetic trees. For each amino acid, calculate the value for the relation between amino acid A and B in terms of mutation, depend on the probability that uh, amino acid mutates, amino acid A mutates, and the probability that uh, amino acid A mutate to B, given that A mutates. So this is totally mathematically, mathematical terms. Um, uh, the Kabran Kalyan things, like as I say in, in our mathematics class, that we, I hate most. Okay, so you see, uh, A mutates to B, and you have to have a condition that A already mutates. Quite weird, huh? but in probability, it's like this. Uh, we need to count this into, yeah based on the relative mutability of non amino acids of few thousand, two thousand amino acids from 2000 genes, we need to come up with this substitution matrix and count the probability of A mutate, A mutate to B and so on. 
okay? And then this is a substitution matrix. That means how A mutated to B, how B, how A mutated to T, how is the probability, okay? But when we turn the probability into score, there are different things. Some over all position in the alignment to give S the score. Okay, whatever it is, is S is a log odd ratio of two probability. The probability that two rates do I and J are aligned by evolutionary descent and the probability that they are aligned by chance. So the positive value is the probability of those two residue being aligned is greater in the match model than the random model. Meaning that uh, you need to have a matrix in order to score it, you need to match, make sure that uh, in terms of probability, it is really a related sequence. Yeah, it's not simply a random things. All right. So uh, don't ask me. I also um, so I'm not good in statistics also. Yeah. But when scientists, biologists use statistics, I would say they are like supermen. Okay. They can understand these things. What I can tell is, uh, you must be in mind things are related, decent from the common ancestor. Everything is evolutionary related. So we need to count this into the matrix for scoring. Okay, eventually you come to scoring. Oh, so there are two scores. System one is called palm scoring matrix. The other is blossom. Okay, so uh, they are used for different purposes. So palm PM is point accepted mutation ideal for global alignment. Yeah. So for blossom, it is uh, called block substitution matrix. So it looks for blocks of similarity. La. So that's why if you look at small segments, it's good for local alignments. Of course, for local alignments, it is good for distantly related sequences. And of course, and of course, when we do alignment of DNS amino acid sequence, we need to think uh, this amino acid distantly or closely related before we choose the right matrix. Okay, that's the idea here. Wait, why I type this thing here? Oh, probably cut off. So, uh, time's up. I need to go for the meeting. Uh, so, I will continue this uh, next week, next Friday morning. Yeah. So, uh, Doctor, yes? Can we have the recording? Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Later, I share want to refer back. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. I think I need to stop here. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, doctor, the OBE attendance, right? Um, it's not. It's not giving the access. Like it, it denies us. Uh, like before, right? Yeah. The link for the OBE attendance. Yeah. Yeah, but it's the last one. Last week, I still got the record. You, you got the uh, oh. attendant record. I so, see. but uh, just like Shafika mentioned, I, I, I go into the wrong link. I should have register to the as a lecture rather than an event. So I will I will I will uh, shut it out. But anyway, just do like what last week. Last week you your I really got your record in the OB. Yeah. Oh okay. So no worry lah. Okay. All right. Thank you doctor for today's session. All right. Thank you. See you next week.